It's Easter Sunday. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what he's talking about because you have new life in you. Somebody has said because of the coronavirus, Easter's going to be canceled this year. Well, Easter can't be canceled because Easter has already happened. Every Sunday that we get together, we're celebrating Easter. Every day I walk in my relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm living out Easter. Even that first set of disciples as they were hiding there in the upper room, Jesus came right to where they were. And so just because we can't be together doesn't mean that we can't celebrate Easter. Because you know, hope has risen. So much to celebrate today and so we're going to get ready to celebrate communion so that means that you can use whatever works for you at home to represent the bread and to represent the juice and you might want to pause this so that you can get those things if you haven't already received it Luke tells us that later that Easter Sunday two of Jesus's disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus a journey of about 17 miles they were in the midst of a discussion about all the events of the last few days when Jesus walked up and accompanied them on their journey. They were unaware it was Jesus walking right there beside them, for God prevented them from recognizing him. Jesus said to them, You seem to be in a deep discussion about something. What is it that you're talking about that has you so sad and gloomy? They stopped, and the one named Cleopas answered, Haven't you heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem who has, is unaware of the things that have happened there over the last few days? And Jesus asked, Well, what things? Well, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a mighty prophet of God who performed miracles and wonders. His words were powerful, and he had great favor with God and the people. But three days ago, the high priest and the rulers of the people sentenced him to death and had him crucified. We all hoped that he would be the one who would redeem and rescue Israel. Early this morning, some of the women informed us about something. It was truly amazing. They said they went to the tomb and they found it empty. They claimed two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. Some of us went to see for ourselves and found the tomb exactly as the women said, but no one has seen him. Jesus said to them, Why are you so thick-headed? Why do you find it hard to believe every word the prophets have spoken? Wasn't it necessary for Christ, the Messiah, to experience all the sufferings and afterward to enter into his glory? 
Then he carefully unveiled to them the revelation of himself through Scripture. He started from the beginning and explained all the writings of Moses and all the prophets, showing how they wrote of him and revealed the truth about himself. And Luke says that as they approached the village, Jesus walked on ahead, telling them that he was going to a distant place. They urged him to remain there and pleaded with him, stay with us. It will be dark soon. So Jesus went with them into the village. Joining them at the table for supper, he took bread. He blessed it, and he broke it. And then he gave it to them. All at once, their eyes were opened, and they realized it was Jesus. Then suddenly, in a flash, Jesus vanished before their eyes. Stunned, they looked at each other and said, why didn't we recognize him? Didn't our hearts burn within us with flames of holy passion when he walked beside us? He unveiled for us such profound revelation from the scriptures. And so they left at once and hurried back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. When they found the eleven and all the other disciples, they overheard them saying, It's really true. The Lord has risen from the dead. He even appeared to Peter. Then the two disciples told the others what had happened to them on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus had unveiled himself as he broke bread with them. Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. Emmaus means burning place. No matter what's happening in the world around us, don't lose sight of who Jesus is. Make sure that the fire of his presence is still lit in your life. Luke's gospel begins and ends with similar experiences. Near the beginning of the gospel, we have the story of Jesus' parents walking out of Jerusalem and leaving him in the temple. They're unaware that they've left Jesus behind. As Luke comes near the end of his account, Jesus here comes up beside two disciples and they're not even aware of who he is. They're not, they've lost sight of him. He has to remind them what the scripture foretold and promised about him. It's like all of a sudden their eyes become open to who Jesus is for the first time. He's not just Jesus from Nazareth. He's not only a great prophet. He's not some mighty miracle worker. He's not just another dashed hope in an uncertain world. He is the risen Lord. He is their cup running over with grace and forgiveness and an abundant life. He is the broken bread that burns in their soul as they take him into their lives. All that he is and that all he has done for them. Don't lose sight of who Jesus is in your world that seems darker, more broken, panicky, and feeling desperate, more desperate perhaps than ever before. Remember where your hope is found. And yes, there is hope for you, no matter how you failed God. Because you see, the risen Jesus appeared even to Peter, as we're told, the one who denied him three times. And so no matter how many times you betrayed him or abandoned him, God will always love you and never abandon you. Be aware of who's still with you. Jesus is the one certainty in a day that's overwhelmed with uncertainty. Keep him burning in your life with flames of holy passion. Jesus has revealed himself to you. Don't forget who he is, what he has done for you and what he has yet to do. So spend some time now being aware of Jesus in your life before you eat and drink in remembrance of him.
Lord, may we be reassured today that there is nothing we face in life that is greater than you and greater than your love for us. There is no fear or failure that can overcome your grace and your power at work in us. Thank you for being broken for our sins and for filling us with a whole new and abundant life. We, may we not forget that our cup runs over with all that we really need in you. Burn deeply in our hearts and flow freely through our lives because Jesus, our living hope, lives in us today. Ray Stedman said that the resurrection of Jesus is not only good news, it's the best news possible. Today we celebrate the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. And I hope we're celebrating, celebrating the greatest thing that has ever happened personally in the history of your life. Jesus coming, dying, rising, and living inside of you. After Jesus was crucified, there were maybe about 120 followers that were true to his message. Not a very big church by today's standards, yet the Christian church is by far the largest organization in the world today. It's bigger than the population of China, Europe, and the United States together. Why did Christianity spread so far and so fast? How could a little band of 12 poor fishermen, a tax collector, and a few zealots grow into something so big? There's only one answer. Jesus' resurrection. Jesus was dead in the ground for three days, and then he came back to life. The case for Jesus' resurrection is overwhelming. It's the one of the most documented and researched events in history. The evidence that Jesus came back is compelling and believable. Nothing else can adequately explain the birth of Christianity other than that the disciples were truly convinced that Jesus had risen. The famed atheist, agnostic novelist, Anne Rice, was convinced that there had to be a better explanation. And so she set out to find out what it was. What had happened during that first century to give rise to what she thought was the myth of Jesus? Well, here's how she described her research. She says, having started with the skeptical critics, I expected to discover that their arguments would be frighteningly strong, and Christianity was at heart a kind of fraud. Surely Jesus was liberal, married, had children, was a homosexual, and who knew what. But I must do my research before I wrote one word. She says, I was convinced by the wild postulations of those who claimed to be children of the Enlightenment. I had also sensed something else. Many of these scholars apparently devoted their life to, to New Testament scholarship, but they disliked Jesus Christ. In some, the whole case for the non-divine Jesus who stumbled into Jerusalem, somehow got crucified by nobody, and had nothing to do with the founding of Christianity, and would be horrified by it if he knew about this, that whole picture that had floated around in liberal circles, and that I frequented as an atheist for 30 years, that case was not made. Not only was it not made, I discovered this field in, some of the, in this field some of the worst and biased scholarship I'd ever read. Christianity achieved what it did, she says, because Jesus rose from the dead. It was the fact of the resurrection that sent the apostles out into the world with the force necessary to create Christianity. Anne says, nothing else would have done it but that. The evidence of Jesus' resurrection is so overwhelming. If you really look into it, the only, only by having a preconceived bias against the resurrection could you believe that it really had not happened. So what is it that keeps so many people from considering the truth of the resurrection on its own merits? The fact that Jesus rose from the dead. 
Well, what else must be true if, if he did indeed? Well, all that Jesus said about morality, how we should live our lives, and that we should serve God. You see, that's what keeps many people rejecting the resurrection. Because by believing in the resurrection, then I would also have to believe that Jesus is Lord over my life. The resurrection is the best explanation of the facts. Peter gives his first sermon ever preached in the church, and he ends it by saying, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of this. I mean, this is the same guy who denied Jesus three times. And now he's standing up and bearing witness to it. And in his very next sermon, he says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. So something has to dramatically have happened to change this man into now witnessing about what he was running away from. No fewer than 11 passages in Acts proclaim Jesus' resurrection. The message that led to the early church was simply this. Jesus rose from the dead. The importance of the resurrection is clearly stated by Paul, another person who was completely against the Christian faith from the beginning. And this is what Paul says. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is our faith. The Christian faith is worth nothing. And we're to be pitied as believers of Christ if Jesus stayed dead and was not resurrected. If he did not overcome death, then neither will we. Most people believe that when it comes to the resurrection, the burden of proof is on believers to give evidence that it actually took place. But you know, it also puts the burden of proof on unbelievers. It's not enough to say that Jesus wasn't risen. You then have to come up with an historically feasible explanation to explain the existence of the church. So I'm going to give you some bare minimum historical facts about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection that virtually all historians agree on. To look at all the facts would take several sermons because, I mean, the, again, the evidence is just overwhelming. But I want, what I want you to see is that if Jesus rose from the dead, he is your only hope. And he is a hope worth living for. And so the first fact is Jesus died by crucifixion. His death actually occurred. This is well documented. First, the New Testament says this, Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went up to the place called the Place of the Skull. And that's sort of interesting because the Place of the Skull, historically it's believed that Golgotha was where David buried the head of Goliath, the greatest giant that the Israelites faced in their history. And here Jesus is going up to the place of the skull to take on the biggest giant in our lives, sin and death. And it says, there they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. More than any other matter about Jesus, historians are convinced that Jesus actually lived and Jesus and did, did indeed die on a cross. His death by crucifixion is virtually indisputable. Christians and other secular sources, such as the Roman historian Tacitus, say that Jesus was crucified. Here's what he said. He said, Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, that's Christ, from whom the name has originated, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. The Jewish historian, uh, Josephus, and since he was a Jewish historian, he had nothing to gain by what he's about to say. He wrote this in his Jewish Antiquities. He said about the time that there lived a man named Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one could call him a man. For he wrought surprising feats. He 
was the Christ. Again, this is a Jewish historian. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, Josephus says, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. And so John goes on and he says, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. Already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. The separation of blood and water is strong medical proof of death. Jesus lived and Jesus died on the cross. His life and death are historical facts. The second fact is Jesus' followers believed in a risen Jesus. The disciples at first did not believe that Jesus had been resurrected. And so when the women came back from the tomb saying that they had seen Jesus, it says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now Jesus had foretold that he was going to be resurrected, but it's like it never sunk in. It's like they for forgot it. And possibly they didn't believe it. Even though Jesus was talking about it, they weren't expecting it. After Jesus was crucified, they were in hiding. They thought he was dead, and they believed they were next in line. Something dramatic would have had to happen to change these men from cowards into courageous proclaimers of a resurrected Jesus. These men were skeptics, and it took much to convince them that this had happened. Peter and John ran to the tomb after hearing the claims of the women. Then Peter ran into the tomb, and it says he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, John also went inside, and he saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And so the disciples went from doubters to being fully convinced of Jesus' resurrection. Why be martyred for something that they didn't believe was true? If they ran away when Jesus was arrested, they would have surely run away and recanted if their own life was on the line. The religious leaders concocted the story that the disciples had stolen the body. And so men might die for something that they think is true, but I don't know of any men who are willing to die for something they know isn't true. These men died for their faith because they saw a resurrected Lord. They knew it was true. There's a third fact we're going to look at. They were eyewitnesses. Notice what it says here. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, Luke says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and this was actually Paul, not Luke, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to me, or more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Paul says that Jesus appeared to the apostles, and hundreds of people after his resurrection, most of whom are still living, and you can check out my story, he says. Now, we all, we all know about witnesses, eyewitnesses. I mean, when you have a court case that's being tried, eyewitnesses are an important part of deciding the truth. And there are things that matter about those eyewitnesses. One thing that matters is, how many of them are there are? I mean, if one person comes up and says, this is what I saw, but another person says something completely different, then that's going to cause problems. But when you have, you know, hundreds of eyewitnesses saying, this actually happened, this is what I saw, that's, that's an important thing. The other thing that really matters is the character of the witness. If someone is a, has been a liar all along, or a coward all along, then that's going to make a difference in how we hear their story. But if we know this person to be somebody of character, 
all these people somebody of character, then what they have to say really matters. And so in Acts 2.32, in Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he says, God raised, has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. You know, you can almost stand, see several people standing up there with Peter. We're all witnesses. Peter said this to thousands of people. They could have all gone to verify it. Nobody would have believed the message for a minute if they had gone to the tomb and they saw that Jesus' body was still there. And so a witness is only as trustworthy as his character. The listeners would have had to check out the character of Peter and the other disciples, and they would have seen these guys are different men from what we knew before. Their testimony is reliable. These men have not only talked publicly, they're willing to die for something that they know is true. And that brings us to two witnesses. James and Paul gave their lives for Jesus. Notice what Paul says. He says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. These two men, James and Paul, did not follow Jesus while he was living. Uh, we're told that, that even Jesus' his own brothers didn't believe in him while he was living. When Jesus started his ministry, Mark records that his family, when they heard about this, they went out to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And so his family thought he was crazy, not that he was the Christ. What would make James change from thinking Jesus was a lunatic to becoming the leader of the early church and now ready to die for believing that his older brother was actually the Son of God. You see, he had witnessed Jesus' life all through his life. But now something's changed. James. Paul says it was the resurrected Jesus who appeared to James, turning him from a doubter into a believer. Now, Paul understood that kind of change because he experienced it himself. He says, last of all, he appeared to me on the Damascus Road. How do you explain somebody like Paul, formerly called Saul, a persecutor and murderer of Christians, becoming Paul, the greatest missionary in the history of the church and the writer of so many New Testament books? Paul becoming a committed follower of Jesus would have been like Osama bin Laden converting and becoming a Billy Graham. You know, that's just not going to happen. Only a dramatic life experience could make that take place. One of the most respected and influential philosophers of the last century, Dr. Richard Swinburne of Oxford, known for his ability in evaluating evidence, argued in a book that based upon historical evidence, there's a 90%, 97% likelihood that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I would say those are pretty good odds. Most of us would be willing to believe something that is, that is true on far less odds than that, 97%. A man said to his pastor that he would be happy to believe in Christianity if the preacher could give him a watertight argument that it was true. The preacher said, well, what if God has not given us a water, you know, a perfectly watertight argument, but rather a watertight person? Jesus says, I'm that person. Come to me. Look at who I am. Look at the cross. Look at the resurrection. Nobody could have made this up. Come to me and find rest for your souls. So how do we find resurrection, hope? Because that's what Easter gives to us. Again, Paul writes, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But instead of being hopeless, 
We have the greatest hope in the world. Because he goes on and he says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. In the second century, a terrible epidemic struck the Roman world. At its peak, 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome alone. Years later, the Bishop of Alexandria wrote in his Easter message that out of the blue came this disease, a thing more frightful than any disaster whatever. Sounds sort of familiar? This is the period when it seemed like the church took off just out of the blue too. Why? Because Christians brought hope where nobody else had hope. So there are six reasons I'm going to give you today why the resurrection of Jesus gives you hope. One is, you are completely forgiven. Totally forgiven. Absolutely forgiven. Forever forgiven. You know, who really, who really killed Jesus on the cross? It wasn't Judas. It wasn't Caiaphas, the high priest. It wasn't even Pilate the Roman leader, or re religious leaders. It wasn't even the crowd. The shocking answer is twofold. First, God did. It was His plan from the very beginning. As He says in Isaiah, all of us have strayed away like sheep. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him the guilt and sins of us all. So it was part of God's plan from the very beginning. Who put Jesus on the cross? God? We also did. I did. You did. Our sins put him on the cross. Paul says Jesus was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. Our sins killed Christ. The good news is... God sacrificed Jesus to make us right with Him. Jesus died to set you free from all the guilt and shame of sin. God has forgiven you. In Christ, we have been set free by the blood of His death, and so we have forgiveness of sins because of God's rich grace. The, the good news is God has given his, Himself so that we might find freedom from the biggest thing about ourselves, and that's sin. In the story of the prodigal son, many people assume prodigal means runaway or rebellious. But you know, it actually means reckless or wasteful. The most reckless person in the story is not the younger son. It certainly wouldn't be the older son because he, he avoid tried to be reckless at all costs. The most reckless person in the story is actually the Father with His forgiveness. No matter how reckless you've been in your life, God's forgiveness is even more reckless for you. A second reason why we have hope is you're no longer afraid to die. Jesus takes away the fear of death. When He died on the cross, He broke that fear. Fear of death is still the number one universal fear. It's part of what's driving people's fear today with the coronavirus. When you're dying, you're hoping for something beyond this life. Just before he died, Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, told an interviewer that he sometimes believed in God, and he sometimes didn't. But after he was diagnosed with cancer, he really wanted to believe. Jesus came not only to give us power over sin, but also power over death. Both were defeated on the cross. Jesus promised, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, like everybody else, they will live again. Jesus promised that we would live on and live better than we can live right here and now. John Ortberg says, Christians are people who are better off dead. I mean, we usually don't think of people who are as dead as being better off, but they really are. That's because something better 
is waiting for you when you die in the Lord. Jesus proved he had power over death when he was resurrected from the grave. That's what it took to change the disciples. How else again do we explain this sudden transformation in their lives from being scared to death to being willing to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ? They were running, they were defeated, they were demoralized, they were disillusioned, they were in despair. Three days later, however, they were ready to take on the Roman Empire. What happened? They saw Jesus. He was resurrected. He was alive again. And now they had life in him. If you saw somebody walking down the street that you knew was dead, I mean, you'd been to their funeral. They had been buried, you know, just earlier in the week. How would you feel if you saw them again? Maybe you'd be confused at first, even scared. But as you talked to them, and even as you reached out and touched them, you would see they were alive. And you'd be overwhelmed with joy. Do you think you would ever forget that experience? Not on your life. Wouldn't it change your, your worldview about life and death? Absolutely. Would it give you hope of life beyond the grave? You better believe that it would. You have hope in Jesus because you also have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Jesus' death and resurrection gives you more than just power over life and power over death. It also gives you power to live your life for Him. A new life. Jesus Himself said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. This is power to live a new way, power to carry out God's will, power to tell others about what he has done for you, to tell it fearlessly. Paul writes, I pray, he pray, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe in him. It is that same mighty power that brought Christ back from the dead. You have resurrection power. It's the same spiritual power, the same life-giving power that left an empty, empty tomb and a risen Christ. The Holy Spirit has that same power that changed the disciples from fearful men into fearless followers of Jesus. They went from hopeless to hopeful, cowardly to courageous because they had the Spirit of God living inside of them. Nothing could stop them from sharing Jesus with the rest of the world, not even the fear of death. That same power can set you free from your past. That same power can break the chains of whatever has been holding you back in life. That same power to start over can keep you going when you feel like giving up. It's the power to change what you can never change about yourself. It's the power to overcome your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups and your persistent sins, that power is available to you because of the resurrection. Resurrection power gave them hope, and it's the reason we have hope today. You also have hope because God will never stop loving you. The resurrection proves that God's love never wears out. He says through the prophet Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. His death on the cross shows you that his love for you is greater than all the sin in your life, greater than all the sin in the world. We all know this passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So great is God's love for us that he gave us his son. He died to have you for himself. He wants you so much. You are that valuable to him. You are his most prized possession. God's love for you is based on who he is, not on who you are or what you've done. God is love. God defines what love is. If you want to see what God's love looks like, see Jesus on the cross for you. See Jesus in the grave for you. See Jesus resurrected to give new life to you. Christianity spread fast 
Not only because it was a message of hope, but it was also a message of love. God's love changes people, and God uses changed people to change other people. When some of these epidemics were erupting in the Roman Empire so long ago, everybody else was fleeing the cities, but the Christians stayed behind to take care of those who were sick. It's because they had discovered a God who loved them. And part of the, the message of the gospel is you were to love others as God has loved, have loved you. And so that's what they were doing. Love changes us. It proves God's love for us. Love changed Paul, a terrorist, into a man who wrote things like this. He says, this is how we know who the children of God are. Anyone who does not obey God's command, doesn't love others, is not a child of God. This is the message we've heard from the beginning. We must love each other. And this is what Paul said. I got ahead of myself there. He said, love is, is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's own achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honestly, honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love never takes failure as defeat. Love never gives up. It never stops loving. We have hope because we know the purpose of life. When you know God, it's because you've given your life to Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you know what you're here for. You know why you exist. You understand the meaning of life. It's very simple. To know God, to love God, to live for God, to serve God. When you don't know your purpose for living, you are as empty as a tomb on Easter morning. But when you know Christ, you now have a purpose to know Him and to make Him known, to love Him and to share His love, to live by His power, to fulfill His calling upon your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to what? Give you hope and a future. God created you on purpose. When you live by his plans for your life, it fills you with hope. It gives you the future that God had in mind for you when he created you. Jesus says, if you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to live. God says, when you go with my plan, you're going to know how to really live. You're going to, only by giving your life away, do you find the resurrected life. He's saying you're not really living until you know what's worth dying for. And then hope number six, you have an eternal home waiting for you. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you know that death that death is not the end. It's a transition to a much better life. In the Jack Nicholson movie, As Good As It Gets, he asked that question. Is this as good as it gets? If you're not a believer of Jesus, life here is as good as it's going to get for you. But if you're a believer in Jesus, life here is the worst that it's going to get. It's going to get so much better. As we're told, no eye has seen, no one, has, no one ear has ever heard, no one human heart has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is incredible, indescribable. It's intended for you. You've never seen yourself at your best. Even on your good days, you've been subject to bacteria, viruses, weariness and wounds. You've never known yourself completely as God intended, but you will. 
Try to imagine a body with no pain, a mind with no wandering thoughts. Envision yourself as completely whole. That's pretty hard for us to do. Before Jesus returned to heaven, he said this to his followers. Do not let your hearts be distressed. Why? Well, here's where your hope is. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. There are many dwelling places in my father's house. Otherwise, I would have told you, because I'm going to make ready a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, then I will come again and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you may be too, and you know the way to where I'm going. Well, Thomas, one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the truth. Everything he said was true. Everything the Bible says about him is true. You can trust him. He's the way to have true hope and really live. Jesus rose so that you would be resurrected to a new life in him. Is Jesus living his life in you today? He can if you'll just welcome him in. Jesus, you're the only certainty in a very uncertain world. You are alive today and living in the heart of every person who puts their trust in you. I pray right now for that individual who might be listening on this Easter morning who hasn't yet experienced the resurrected life of you in their heart, that now will be the time when they would say, Jesus, I realize that my only hope and greatest need is you. As you've loved me, Jesus, I give my life and my love over to you. Fill me with your presence and the life that only you can give me. A full life, a free life, a joyful life, a peaceful life, a loving life, an eternal life, a life full of hope. We pray this in the name of the only one who gave his all so that we might experience all that you have for us, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>